The following program is brought to you by Caltech. I realized this morning that I'm the only person talking at this that has had no official association with Caltech. And of course, I'm here presumably because the last 20 years that uh, were alluded to by John of Murray being involved with the Santa Fe Institute, where he was one of the uh, founders. Um, and many of you are familiar with the fact that uh, Murray wrote this uh, book, this wonderful book, The Quark and the Jaguar. And indeed, presumably, this talk is the Jaguar part of the talk of the uh, symposium. Uh, but first, I would like to congratulate both Murray and George for you know, some uh, an extraordinary insight into uh, fundamental physics. And now that John brought up Lars, where is John sitting, as head of the Nobel Committee, I think one of the great um, I, I, oversights, maybe is the way of putting it, I would put it more strongly, is that I just do not understand why this has not got a Nobel Prize. This extraordinary piece of work never got a Nobel Prize, and I would advocate everybody here to work hard to convince Lars and his committee that George Zweig and Murray Gell-Mann get the Nobel Prize for the quark. It's extraordinary. The discovery of the quark has been rewarded with the Nobel Prize, but not the, so to speak, the conceptual invention and all the wonderful things that we've heard about. Um, so um, I will talk a little bit about um, somehow the bridge between quarks and high energy physics and the Jaguar, so to speak. And uh, let's see. And I sort of uh, made up this title. I'm not too sure. I mean, the reference, obviously, to the book. Um, but um, and I've, um, I'm, I'm going to have to wing it in some of these things, because I wasn't too sure who the audience was, what the nature of it was, whether it was technical, non-technical, and so on. Um, but um, I want to um, remind you of something that uh, maybe Jim, uh, Jim Hartle's first talk about the fact that um, many people think that Murray turned to these ideas, the Jaguar complexity ideas of complex adaptive systems and some of the big questions on the scale of uh, the global scale rather than the universal scale uh, late in his life. But I think this has been a theme throughout his career, actually. Many of the issues that he deals with now, I think he has been thinking about, along with quarks and strings and supersymmetry and so forth. So I want to introduce it, but I went back to some old transparencies, I guess, and I made copies uh, from a time when some of this stuff uh, was developing in terms of QCD. And um, I'm going to introduce <laughs> it by going back to Galileo and uh, something that you're all familiar with, that uh, one of the great things that Galileo realized was that um, this extraordinary limits to growth, uh, namely that uh, the strength of material of a beam only increases like the cross-sectional area, whereas what it holds up increases like its weight and therefore like its volume. So the strength to weight ratio inevitably eventually goes to zero and buildings and animals and things collapse, which means that there's a limit to growth. And uh, so if you don't change anything, then uh, you, you have to stop somewhere. It gives maximum heights of trees, buildings, and so forth. And of course, this is a theme not just throughout engineering, but throughout all of physics. Things change with scale. and. Uh, I will come back to that in, uh, shortly, but in this limited context, you have to either change design, materials, you have to innovate in some way. And a theme of Murray's career has actually been thinking about such problems, both in the grand scale and at the scale of the environment. And one of his passions has been the question of the future of the planet. And part of his motivation, I think, for the foundation of the Fan Santa Fe Institute and by the way, those that are not familiar, it was founded uh, about 25 odd years ago by a group of extremely distinguished physicists, Murray being one of them, Phil Anderson another, uh, Ken Arrow, the famous uh, economist, uh, David Pines and others like that. 
who were concerned about uh, questions that were falling between the cracks, that were crossing disciplines, ones that uh, involved what became known eventually as complexity, um, and the questions of the environment and sustainability were among them. And it is kind of ironic, Murray, with his extraordinary foresight in the early 90s, had formulated a program called, I think, Earth 2050, I believe it was, um, that was to do with, you know, we need to understand questions of global warming already then, questions of limits, not just to growth, but limits to resources and so on. And uh, he formulated that program and uh, amazingly, effectively could get no funding for it because people did not think this was a serious question for serious scientists to be involved in. So this problem limped along with a teeny bit of money from, I forget if it was the World the Wildlife Association or whatever, but they limped along for a little bit and then collapsed in the mid to late 90s. And now, of course, you go along any, every campus, maybe even Caltech, but every campus has its institute for uh, um, sustainability or global warming and so on. So all of these issues that Murray was quite passionate about he had this extraordinary foresight, and it's a very much a hallmark of Murray being way ahead of his time in thinking about these. So, well, there's a little picture I drew, just to remind you <laughs> about the strength. Uh, but uh, another aspect, of course, uh, of Murray's career was the renormalization group, which was a tremendous insight into um, something that now seems fairly obvious to one in retrospect, but was not clear at the time. But it also has, of course, its manifestation in uh, classical physics, and that is the idea that characteristics are scale dependent, such as coupling constants and so on, but also things like as mundane as the length of a coastline. This is the famous graph of the length of the Norwegian coastline, and if you measure it as a function of scale, it changes because, of course, you see finer and finer granularity. The finer and finer you make that grid, but in an extraordinary regular way, illustrated by this, so what's plotted here logarithmically is the length of the coastline versus the resolution, delta being the resolution, and you see a nice straight line indicating a power law. Is this the thing? A power law here, and this is the famous kind of uh, uh, introduction of fractals, the fractal self-similar nature of things like coastlines that Mandelbrot made a career out of. Um, but um, uh, so that, of course, is intimately related conceptually to something that happens in quantum mechanics, namely, of course, that uh, th from the uncertainty principle, and we've heard this already, that um, the, the finer the resolution, the more unknown, so to speak, is the energy. Therefore, as you go finer and finer resolution, uh, something like a quark or an electron looks differently because it can create more and more virtual particles uh, given the amount of energy that becomes available as you decrease the resolution. So as you go on, all its characteristics change in a regular way that is governed by the underlying theory, in this case, uh, either QED or QCD and so on. And um, uh, so the, the, all, the, all the characteristics are scale dependent, and I've written at the top of the next slide from an old transparency uh, just the, how this thing scales in terms of if you change the scale at which you decide to fix the value of whatever the parameters are, the coupling constant or the mass and so on, call it mu, mu squared, and you change it by a factor lambda, there is some scaling relationship. And the theory, of course, determines that z that uh, relates one scale to the other for the property that you're looking at. And in the middle there is, the, uh, is some version of the renormalization group equation using the modern language of beta functions and gamma functions rather than psi. And Murray, of course, was instrumental in this. But this led, of course, to this marvelous idea that um, not only do these things change in a regular fashion, but they change in a way that the coupling constants of all what were perceived of as different forces all come together at a given scale. And this is, this is a remarkable discovery. Many people in this room were involved in things like this. Um, and giving the idea, first of all, of a grand unified theory, because the couplings which we had thought of when we thought of this list of independent forces 
that these characteristics, both their range, their, their, particularly their strength, the last row there, is actually a scale-dependent quantity. But there is a scale at which at least the first three come together, and this gave rise to all of the modern thinking about forming a grand unified theory, and ultimately, as we've heard from John, a theory of everything. But that theory of everything, of course, uh, as some of my biologist friends often remind me, calculates nothing, and in particular, I hate, in particular, cannot deal with the kinds of questions that we deal with at global scales. And we heard that already in the talk of Jim about the mesoscale of which we live is the, is the scale of complexity. And uh, the complexity is most wonderfully manifested by something that is astonishingly happening around us as we speak at an exponential rate, namely the, the urbanization of the planet, illustrated here. And this is an extraordinary universe we live in, not just in terms of the universe and all the wonderful things we've heard in the last uh, 24 hours or less, but in fact, the astonishing things that are happening in the global universe, the global planet we live in, because we live in an exponentially expanding socioeconomic universe. And just to give you some numbers, we have gone in this country from a few percent being urbanized to over 80 percent being urbanized in the last couple of hundred years. The world crossed the halfway mark uh, just a few years ago. It will reach the 80 percent mark somewhere after the middle of this century. And it's happening at a rate that is roughly a million and a half people being urbanized every week, which means that in two months' time, there is the equivalent to the entire Los Angeles metropolitan area, again, somewhere on this planet. If you add it up, two months later, another Los Angeles. Two months after that, another Los Angeles. And that's going to go on to mid-century. And this is an extraordinary phenomenon. And this, the question is, is any of that, in fact, sustainable? So. Urbanization is a problem. All the problems that we face from global warming, financial markets, questions of the economy, the questions of health, pollution, disease, energy, resources, water, et cetera, et cetera, all are driven by this exponential expansion. On the other hand, <clears throat> any solution to it is also due to, uh, uh, must come from urbanization because the other aspect of urbanization is all the smart people live in cities. Cities are vacuum cleaners that suck up smart people, they smuck up, suck up people, but in particular, all the ideas, the innovation, and the wealth is pretty much created in cities. So understanding this dual nature, and in particular developing what I shall refer to as a science of cities, or asking the question, could there conceivably be a physics of cities that we can understand this in quantitative predictive terms, maybe not like we do QCD or even QED, that is a big issue, and it's an issue worthy of attention. So here's what I just said, and, um, uh, and I'm going to spend a little time talking about that, and it's shamelessly as a way of using my own work to illustrate the kinds of ideas that Murray has been promoting for the last, actually, 50 years, but in particular for the last 20 years, and which uh, uh, inspired him with the others to form the uh, Santa Fe Institute to find people and attract people that are interested in questions that transcend the usual boundaries and, uh, of, of the disciplines and also address some of these bigger questions uh, at this, this scale. So here's a city, here's a city, and this is, you know, they're extraordinary objects, but, but this is one of the reasons people live in city, access to all these nice things, culture, and uh, universities and fine dining and all the rest of the stuff. And all of that leads to this extraordinary open-ended economy th that we live in. Everything is sort of exponentially growing, and there's this exponentially open uh, stock market that continues. And I think you don't have to even be a physicist to know that this can't continue forever. Something has to give. You can't have open-ended exponential growth ad infinitum. And the question is, how do we get around that is this what happens? So that's what I'm going to try to discuss. And, but we also know from simple thermodynamics that if you're creating all this marvelous stuff, you have to pay a price. There's thermodynamics, is, uh, of course, transcends all of this. And there's socioeconomic, what I call socioeconomic entropy. There's an outcome of this, 
So these kinds of things are kind of an inevitable outcome. Uh, and the question is, is that what Los Angeles is going to look like in 20 years? Uh, are we going to have lots of things like this uh, or like this? This is good. This would be good. This is good. I think this is Bombay, actually. I'm not sure. But it's what a city really is. It's people interacting. It's doing what we're doing, interacting with each other. This is Murray's background. This is New York City 100 years ago. Uh, and this is the very essence of the city, bringing people together to interact, discuss, create, innovate, create wealth, entrepreneurship, and so on. The buzz of a city, that's what we try to create when we make cities, even if this is, we don't do things this way now. We have a different form of interacting, but this is the kind of the essence of a city. And the, the question is, can we put physics into this? Can we make a physical theory out of this? Or are we going to end up, if we don't, if we don't really understand it, is that what things are going to look like? So just this is what I've already said. And one of the big issues in this system, these kinds of systems, and in any complex system, is that um, it is, there's an interesting tension and an interesting question of integration of the kind of physics side of it, the energy, the traditional physics side, energy resource of thermodynamic side, the metabolic side, the infrastructural side of all of these kinds of complex adaptive systems with the informational side. So in biology, that would be genomics or the <coughs> neural system, um, and in socioeconomic systems, innovation. And so this is a big issue as to how to integrate these, and I will maybe touch on it briefly a little bit later. But I actually consider, I mean, f information theory was not taught in physics, maybe still isn't, even though it's entered into physics now through quantum information, a little bit about black holes and so on. But um, taking information theory to the kind of real world situations that we have to deal with, both in terms of biology and social systems, is a huge challenge. And integrating it with uh, the, uh, the, the th more thermodynamic part is an enormous challenge. Because in the fields where these are dominant, biology and the social sciences, they are considered completely separate. Genomics and metabolics are not integrated in biology, and innovation and infrastructure are not integrated typically in socioeconomic systems. OK, so this is the physics view. Search for underlying laws and principles leading to quantitative, predictive, conceptual framework. Well, first of all, what are the kinds of questions we want to talk about? And what level? Well, we can't have a kind of Newton's laws of complexity, although I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so we have, we have a kind of coarse-grained description. So one of the questions one might ask at a coarse-grained level about an audience like this is, why is it that I can predict with absolute certainty everybody in this room will be dead in 100 years? Where in the hell does that number come from? Why isn't it five years? or 500 years, or 5,000, or 5 million years, where in molecular time scales, fundamental time scales, sits 100 years, and why is it that if this hand were a mouse, which it might as well have been, because it's the same stuff, it would have been dead 70 odd years ago. So what, why is that? Where does that come from? If biology were, I often say, and I will get killed for this, if biology were a serious science from a physicist's viewpoint, you would be able to go to a biology textbook, open up on aging, and there would be a calculation that would end up with lifespan of human being is approximately 100 years, and these are the parameters that determine it. And these are the ones that you might want to tune if you want to live for 120 years, or 180 years, or only for 50 years. So that's a serious science as a thing from our biology and social friends that I interact most of my life with now. OK, I will get killed for that. But, uh, uh, so uh, similarly, why do we sleep eight hours? Where in the hell does that come from? Anybody in this room know how long an elephant sleeps? No, of course not. Or a mouse. Mouse sleeps for about 17 hours. An elephant sleeps for about four and a whale for maybe two to three. Now, why? There should be, again, in that textbook, a little calculation. OK, no, furthermore, why is it that mice have many, many more tumors per gram of tissue than we do, and whales have almost none? 
Why in the fuck do we spend trillions of dollars up working on mice to try to find out about cancer if this is true? <laughs> or we need to understand it. This is the other way of looking at it. Okay, and the last one is kind of whimsical, something that intrigues me about what's, uh, I mean, cancer, you grow cancers inside you and they can kill you, but you grow babies inside you and that's supposed to be very good. It is very good. Okay. Now, all of this, I must say, parenthetically, is inspired by my multiple conversations with Murray over many, many years. Uh, like many of us, and I think John mentioned it earlier, I was totally intimidated even saying hello to Murray for the first, until about two years ago, actually. But <laughs> No, for many, many years, certainly my early career. And, uh, but we've developed into a wonderful relationship, a very friendly relationship. And one of the great things about the Santa Fe Institute is bringing lots of people together from many different areas, uh, everything across from archaeology and anthropology, one of Murray's great interests, through uh, things like linguistics, all the way through to, to economics, uh, finance, biology, evolution, and so on. Everything is there, and including people like Cormac McCarthy and Sam Shepard. So there's this extraordinary group of people, and we have wonderful conversations, and I have spent many hours talking with Murray about everything from string theory, philosophy of science, quarks, sex, love, uh, our personal lives, and so on. And uh, it's been a wonderful relationship, and I owe a great deal to Murray for stimulating a lot of questions such as this. Uh, you know, are citizen companies just part of biology? And why is it, for example, uh, they're both socioeconomic systems, why is it that companies like people all die uh, inevitably, and, and uh, whereas all cities, roughly speaking, uh, are, are viable? They're very hard to kill a city. There are classic cases, of course, but most cities survive. So to understand these kinds of questions and understand them in a quantitative framework. Um, so, you know, to develop a theory of this would be that if you have a theory of a company and company mortality as of organismic mortality is to be able to make a prediction, a coarse-grained probabilistic prediction when Google is going to go bust or Microsoft are going to go bust because they certainly will. And the question is, what if if they don't do anything, when is their, what is their natural lifespan? Okay, and what's the mechanism? Okay, so I said this, can there be Newton's laws of complex adaptive systems? The answer is almost certainly no, well, it's, or is no, I think. You can't imagine that you can calculate these things to arbitrary accuracy, which is kind of the, the rules in physics. And here's just a laundry list, which I'm not going to spend any time on, of the kinds of questions and the kinds of issues and characteristics involved in these kinds of systems. There's huge numbers of agents, they're highly collective phenomena, there's all kinds of different scales, it's nonlinear, they're strongly interacting, they're sensitive to boundary conditions, there's all kinds of these emergent behaviors, they're adaptive and evolving, they're historically contingent, there's hysteresis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're way out of equilibrium, and one of the questions from a physicist's viewpoint is their under underlying simplicity under this complexity, and I think that was the essence of the quark and the jaguar. Okay, so going back to this question of uh, biology and socioeconomic systems, the question is, is, is this thing at the top, or this thing at the bottom, just another version of this? And um, that would be good, actually, because it turns out, and I'm not gonna spend any time on this, actually, any question, there is a theoretical development which I will just touch on again momentarily, that allows one to construct a theory of that forest or any forest across the globe, meaning that you have mathematical formula based on underlying generic transcendent principles that allow you to ask, uh, ask and answer quantitatively questions like, how many trees are there of a given size? How many branches of a given size does that tree have? How many leaves does it have? How much energy is flowing for it? What is, how long is it? Are they going to live? How quickly do they grow? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the question is, can you do the same for the city at the bottom? So there's just a trivial example. 
of a very, not, uh, not necessarily complex, but a complicated theory on forests and trees. And one of the trivial predictions that comes out of a complicated theory is the number of trees of a given size as a function of the size of a tree as proxied by its diameter of its tree trunk. And the prediction is that it's an inverse square law, amazingly, approximately. And you can see it's pretty good. And you can see that over 40 years, actually, there's another set of data in the early 2000s for this same forest, uh, that it's the same line. And even though there's enormous turnover of individuals, there's an invariance to this distribution. And there's maybe 25 or 30 such variables like this that one can derive mathematically uh, with these kinds of statistics and these kinds of fits. So one understands very, a lot about forests and how they work. Now, a critical aspect of this theory is, in fact, scalability and, by implication, the use of the renormalization group, amazingly. Uh, because if a system is to be evolving, adapting, and growing, it better be scalable. And indeed, for it to be resilient, and for life itself to be resilient over several billion years, it better be scalable. And any system that is, has this, this Darwinian selection uh, associated with it has to have scalability. And indeed, uh, we are extraordinarily scalable. This is us. We scale over eight orders of magnitude. And there it is, uh, mathemat there's, the, there's the graph. This is the most fundamental quantity in, in a biological system, any complex system, the metabolic rate, how much power do you need as a function of size. And you can see there's an extraordinarily uh, good fit to a straight line on a log log plot. A simple power law is at work. And this is extraordinary. Why is this extraordinary? This is extraordinary because each one of these animals each subsystem, each organ, each cell type, each genome has evolved according to natural selection with its own unique history and its own unique environmental conditions. And yet, so what would you have na sort of naively, if it was natural selection, they'd be all over the map. You plot these things, they would be tremendous spread, reflecting the historical contingency of its evolutionary path. Not so. They line up on this beautiful straight line. And this straight line, so that's the first point. It has this unexpected regularity. Secondly, the slope of this line is less than 1. It's approximately 3 quarters. Um, and that says there's an economy of scale. It says the bigger you are, you need less metabolic rate per capita, therefore less metabolic rate per cell. The bigger you are, surprising, because you would have naively have expected if you double the size, you double the number of cells, you double the amount of energy needed. Not so. You need, actually, if you double the size, approximately 25% less. So there's this extraordinary systematic economy of scale. And I don't know if I showed it. Oh, that's just across different taxonomic groups and all the way down to cells. It's the same line that continues pretty much with that same three. This is actually drawn in to be three quarters. So it's the same thing. So obviously. Either there's some diabolic accident or something fundamental is going on that is constraining the actions of natural selection, the continuous feedback mechanisms of natural selection. OK, so what is that? What can, it, how, what can be? So that's just what I said. Oh, and by the way, uh, yes, this is very important, that if you look at any physiological quantity that you can think of, that you could measure, or any life history event that you could measure, and you plot it in this way, it has the same characteristics. Very simple power laws showing extraordinary regularity. So how in the hell can it be that different evolved designs, a plant, a fish, an insect, a mammal, all scale in the same way? What is it that is common among them? Well, when you think about it, you, the problem you have to face when you have this enormous number of uh, actors in the problem is you have to sustain them in some way. And natural selection has done it in the simplest possible way. It has evolved networks to do that. So underlying all this, oh, I had, didn't realize I had some more graphs to show you. I'm just going to flash these on. This is white to gray matter in the brain. This is genome length, a little more noise in the system, lifespan. Yes, I w should say this, because I talked about death a little bit. Lifespan scales as mass to the one quarter. Heart rate, which is uh, here, decreases as mass to the one quarter. 
So there's a gauge invariance in the problem, <laughs> and there's an invariance, oops, wrong way. There's an invariance in the problem, namely the number of heart rates in the lifespan is an invariant, right? It's about one and a half billion. Whether you're a little thing that sits on the palm of my hand or something that's much, much bigger than this room, it's the same number of heartbeats. And there's nothing much fundamental about that, but uh, there is something fundamental about the number of times turnovers of molecules are, and that is invariant across enormous scales. Okay, so there's these extraordinary scaling laws, and underlying them, as I say, is networks, and they have these fractal-like quantities, and you can just, I'm not gonna dwell on this because I'm gonna take too long, but there are these, the idea is that these have generic properties, properties that transcend the design, like they're space filling, or they optimize something, they minimize energy dissipated. Now, this is a network with huge numbers of degrees of freedom in it, so this is effectively a field theory. This, this is, sets the thing up as a field theory, and this is a field theory. This is what, how it manifests itself in things like this, at all scales. That's a little thing. Uh, it's a little thing that lives inside an elephant, that thing. And that's, uh, my, that's um, inside a cell, and that's inside mitochondria. There's networks at all scales, and the idea is these networks satisfy similar generic kinds of properties independent of the scale and independent of evolved design. So when you put all that into mathematics, so that's where all the work is, and I'm not going to say anything obviously about the technicalities, it's quite technical, nothing on the scale of anything, any of the technicalities you've heard in the last 30, 18 hours or so, but it's still quite technical. You end up with an inter interesting answer that the metabolic rate when you put the network constraints in scales, I did it in D dimensions because the last work I was kind of seriously engaged in in high energy physics was in fact Wes Barton on string field theory, which was hopeless as far as I could tell. And I'm marvelous that you made progress. I'm, but uh, is in D dimensions, and the answer is that it scales as D over D plus one, the exponent is D over D plus one, so that the, we now understand what that four is. The four is not four, it's three plus one, the dimensionality of space you fill, plus one, which has to, has to do with the fractality of these networks. Okay, so there's a million uh, uh, predictions you can make, and I'm not gonna go through it. I'm going to talk very briefly about application to growth, um, and uh, because that's a scaling phenomenon, and uh, you know how you grow, you eat, you metabolize, and you send it through the networks, that's where the networks comes in, and uh, it feeds cells repairs ones that are damaged, replaces ones that have died, and grows new ones. So there it is, write it down. And you can put that into some simple mathematics. And there it is, there's the simple equation. That's the simplest form, I stripped all the bells and whistles. And you can see there's at the top, the metabolic rate comes in, number of cells there, metabolic rate of the cell, energy due to create a cell, rate at which you create them. You put all that into stuff. You have universal parameters. This is true for any organism. And you can solve this equation analytically here. And when you do it, you can get effectively parameter-free predictions for the growth of different kinds of organisms. And then you can rescale it and, uh, in a dimensionless way. And there's this beautiful curve that uh, shows that all organisms, when properly looked at and rescaled with the constraints of the network, all grow, everything grows in the same way, and this is just a very small selection of them. Okay, so I'm gonna go very quickly. Oh, it's been applied to uh, insect colonies and cancer, and I'm not gonna dwell on that. It's, you can do this, okay. So the other thing is that, the other thing that comes out of this is that uh, the bigger you are, everything slows down in a systematic way. So there's kind of a universal time that transcends biology, and uh, this is a summary of what I'm, my, my little summary of biology from this viewpoint, that there are these econ economies of scale, the pace of life slows, growth is sigmoidal, and it's all governed by networks. And I'm gonna talk, oh, I just show a bunch of, this is a motley crew of people, some are very famous and others not so famous. They were postdocs and students, some of them, and they went on, many of them now are at tenured jobs and faculties. Uh, but the, the, I changed the collaboration 
and you can see the different areas they come from to deal with cities, and I'm going to try to finish off quickly uh, to talk a little bit about the cities. So, um, so the first question is, are cities and company scale versions of one another, and is there any universal behavior? So we saw that animals, that the, that the whale, even though it lives in the ocean, and the giraffe with the long neck, and the elephant with the trunk, and we walking on two feet, and mice scurrying around, despite superficial externalities, are actually scaled versions of one another in terms of any kind of physiological or life history measurement you can make on them. And so you tell me the size of an animal, I can tell you pretty much everything about it on the average up to about 80 90 percent level. And it's the 5 to 10 percent, which is the trunk and all the rest of that stuff. So the question is, is that true of cities? Is Los Angeles a scaled down New York City and a scaled up Chicago, which is a scaled up Santa Fe? Well, they look completely different, like the elephant and the uh, giraffe, but uh, are they? And you're going to do that by looking at data. Well, of course, it's in a way, when you think about it, uh, maybe it isn't, it, it, there's, there's reason to believe they might scale because they are networks. You're familiar with the kinds of networks that cities are. They're supplied by networks. But most importantly, and this is the new piece to it, they are places of social networks, these kinds of things, people interacting with each other and the modular nature of those interactions, whether families, groups, physics departments, and so on. There's kind of a modular uh, nature to our interactions. And the question is, does that show up as a scaling phenomenon in some way? So is, does, in fact, do the cities scale? Well, this is the first work I did with some collaborators at the ETH in uh, Zurich. And this was kind of a mundane piece, but it was asking number of gas stations, petrol stations, as a function of city size. And uh, it's plotted in the same log log way. And city size, the proxy used was population. And what you see is there's pretty good evidence of scaling. But most importantly, the scaling is sublinear. Therefore, there's an economy of scale. Not surprisingly, the bigger you are, the bigger the city, the less gas stations per capita. And um, not only that, each of these slopes is quite similar. It's all, each is about 0.8, between 0.8 and 0.9, about 0.85. So there's roughly a 15% savings, roughly, every time you double. But even more astonishing is that this is true everywhere you can get data on gas stations, anywhere in the world. Not only that, it's also true with the same exponent about any infrastructure you look at, whether it's the length of the roads, the length of the gas lines, the length of the water lines, or whatever. Anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world means China, Japan, Europe, United States, Latin America, and so on. Just a caveat, we can't get data easily from India and Africa. So that's the, but um, this is kind of the mundane infrastructural side. But this is the, what I call the information, the innovative side. And what's plotted here is, in the same way, the wages and the number of super creative people, like everybody in this room. And as a function of city size, you can see there's more noise in the system. But what you see, again, strong evidence of scaling. And indeed, they scale in similar ways. But what is amazing is that they scale in similar ways, no matter what socioeconomic quantity you look at, no matter where you look in the world, they scale in the same way with an exponent, which is roughly 1.15. And I show you some of his patents, uh, kind of proxy for innovation of a city. I didn't write down the slope, but it's similar to the others. This is crime in Japan. It's a little bit bigger, but it's similar. Um, this is just a sample of hundreds of data. Like there's police protection, tax receipts, construction, and so on. And here's a, just an example to show the kind of universality. This is income, GDP, crime, and patents, all plotted, renormalized, of course, but plotted on the same graph. And so you have this extraordinary universality that is being expressed, and it can be expressed in English by simply saying, if you double the size of a city, then all of these phenomena, whether it's wealth, patents, number of AIDS cases, uh, the, uh, et cetera, et cetera, crime, all increased by about 15% regardless of the city, regardless of where you are in the world, and at the same time, you save 15% on all the infrastructure. Therefore, this is, a, this is no doubt one of the reasons why 
cities are growing at this extraordinary rate. They're attractive on the collective level because of the savings, but they're attractive on the individual level because of the first, the good and the good part, and we are very good at ignoring the bad and the ugly. Okay, so what is underlying this? How can it be that cities in Japan and in Portugal and the United States all have ended up scaling in the same way, even though there was virtually no interaction in terms of their evolution and growth of cities. Well, you ask yourself, what is the commonality? The commonality, the one thing that is, by the way, often forgotten by people thinking about cities, is that the only reason for cities, I know it sounds <laughs> silly, is because of people. The reason to have cities is because that's where people are going to live. People make them and so on. So, what is common to all cities? People. And what is common is that people are, at the level of which we're talking, at this coarse grain level, identical, roughly, very similar across the globe. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what culture you come from, we're pretty much the same. So, for example, in terms of understanding the dynamics and mathematics of the social networks that underlie this, uh, for example, no culture that we know of uh, is, has evolved where the individual has more than somewhere or less than four to six very uh, tight interactions with another human being. So usually it's a family, but it needn't be. So um, there's four or six people you either love or hate, but you have a very strong interaction with, and that's true across all cultures. So there are things like that that are universal among people, and that goes into the structure. So here's a test of it. This is work recently done with some colleagues at MIT, and that is you ask yourself, okay, how do we uh, measure the social interaction? How do you actually make the measure? There's a theory. I'm not telling you about the network theory, no time. There's a whole network theory to explain these results, but it has a prediction, and that is that if you asked how many, what is the rate of interaction of people as a function of city size, it should scale in the same way as those other things. So here's what this has done, is taking, I forget how many billions of phone calls um, uh, from cell phone data, um, in, this is just two countries, this is United Kingdom and Portugal, and they're plotted, that's the connectivity, that's the number of calls between people on an individual basis, on the y-axis, on the x-axis, the city size, and you can see um, that they do scale, they scale in exactly the same way, whether it's UK or Portugal and other countries in the same way, and the slope is very similar to the other, and I just put them together. So that's, uh, okay, let me finish off very quickly. Um, the network dynamics determines the pace of life. In biology, it slowed everything down. In socioeconomic systems, because it's super linear behavior, the exponent is bigger than one, the more per capita rather than the less per capita, the bigger you are, then this, uh, it has the opposite effect that life speeds up the bigger you are. Life speeds up in cities. And there's some whimsical data here on uh, the speed of walking in cities that was actually taken all oh, many years ago uh, by some psychologists actually at Princeton. And that's the prediction. The red line is actually the prediction of the theory. Okay, um, I'm going to miss this out, and I'm going to finish off with one last thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Um, <laughs> the last thing, very quickly, um, is on the growth. And, uh, and we we'll have the same kind of thing. You have incoming stuff. It metabolizes, so to speak. It, uh, it uh, maintains what's there, and it grows new stuff. So it's the same kind of idea as in biology. And you can write down the equations. The only difference is that the exponent here, which was 3 quarters before, is now this 1.15. And that's what we got in biology. You grew and you stop. And that has been incredibly important in the long-term sustainability of life. Uh, this would be very bad for an economy in our present paradigm. We're supposed to have open-ended growth, continuously open-ended growth. And indeed, if you put that super linear behavior into it, you do get open-ended growth. It's great. There it is. Beautiful. I just got the cartoon of it here. And, uh, but it has a terrible, um, uh, some, one terrible consequence, and that is given by this line here. 
there's a finite time singularity in this problem. And what if you follow it through, the system collapses. As I said, everybody can't continue forever. And the question is, how do you get out of that? Well, we have got out of it because you realize that this has been derived with given boundary conditions. And those given boundary conditions were determined by, so to speak, the major innovation that dominates the culture. It could be you've discovered oil, you've discovered iron, you have invented computers, you've discovered IT, whatever it is, sets some boundary condition. And so this is what would happen. But so what it says, if you're to avoid collapse somewhere along here, you better make a big change and innovate. Change from, uh, ch discover coal, discover IT or whatever. So you start over again. And so you can keep doing this. That's the idea. So there's a theorem that if you want open-ended growth, you have to have continuous cycles of innovation. But there's a huge catch. The huge catch is the following. As you go along here, I already said life has to get faster in a predictable fashion. But worse, the time between these innovations has to get shorter and shorter in a predictable way. Things have to get shorter and shorter. You have to innovate faster and faster. So something that took 1,000 years to develop 10,000 years ago now only takes 25 years. And soon it will have to only take 20 years, and then 15 and 10, and ad infinitum. And the system is clearly not sustainable in that sense. So uh, that's the issue. Um, the, I'll, so that's the question. And I will, given I've talked too long anyway, I will finish there. Um, but uh, this, is, this body of work, stimulated, in fact, by the, uh, the, the institute that Murray helped form, has, um, I think, lays the groundwork potentially for a serious theory of urbanization, but more importantly, for the whole question of sustainability. Um, I want to finish up, if I might. Can I take a minute to take a couple of, I mean, we talk about anecdotes. Um, so one of the, uh, seeing Roberto reminded me of it, and I don't know if he remembers, and I may get my history wrong, but Someone talked, we talked a lot about the job situation in the 70s and how terrible it was. And one of the things that uh, we thought about, you may recall, was an institute that um, would use theoretical physics to attack all kinds of interesting problems. It would do high energy physics, but it would do all kinds of other things. And um, we talked about Roberto and I and Marty Einhorn. So Marty was at Slack, Roberto and I were at Stanford. And um, we mulled it over and talked about it, and we wrote a little white paper. And then, I don't know who it was, it might have been me, it might have been you, talk to him about it. And you, Murray, God bless you, got super excited and turned on and said, this would be great to have a place like that, and it should be on the Presidio in San Francisco. You were prescient once again, because many years later, the Presidio did come available. But um, so that thing, we, and Murray was very good. He got together a, um, a little meeting um, in Aspen at the Aspen Institute, not the Aspen Center for Physics, with a broad group of intellects, senior intellects. And I, I for one, was most intimidated by that. But Murray was our champion and tried to get it going and so on. It never took off and so on. However, there is a footnote to this story, two footnotes. One is I learned at that time about Murray's interest in kind of everything and his desire to have what turned out to be in the end the Santa Fe Institute. But um, the, the thing that was amazing about it was many years later, not so many years later, I got contacted by Boris Kaiser, who said, um, we are thinking, I'm thinking of trying to get an Institute for Theoretical Physics uh, funded by the NSF. And I have heard that you and Peche and Einhorn tried to do something that was broad on this. Do you have anything written? And I dug up the manuscript and I sent it to him. And he told me later I don't know, that that was formed the basis for eventually writing the 
RFP, is that what you call them? For the call for the proposal for what turned into the ITP and then the KITP. And, you know, without that kind of encouragement and your stimulation and input, um, none of that would have happened. Well, it would have happened, of course. But um, it was certainly played a big part in my role, my life, and certainly as <coughs> someone that came to the Santa Fe Institute and eventually found a place where I felt comfortable talking about all these other weird things and get the encouragement has been tremendous. And, uh, and, I, and uh, maybe I should finish there um, and say again, like everybody else, I've been inspired by Murray. Um, I've, I was his boss for a, a number of years. I learned to hate him because he's a pain in the fucking neck sometimes, but I've learned to love him. And I want to say thank you again, Murray, because you were tremendous. And let me give you a big kiss. Thank <laughs> you.